Welcome back. I'm Michael Ball, and this is America's Commercial Real Estate Show. If you'd like to know the absolute latest on any commercial real estate subjects or property sectors, check out our show podcast. Last week, we had a great show on the latest property management issues, trends, and best practices. The week before, we covered the U.S. industrial market. Another show I recommend is the health of the banking industry and commercial real estate auctions. You can download these shows while they are still available on iTunes and on the show website, commercialrealestateshow.com. Well, today we're taking an inside look at the U.S. commercial real estate market and real estate investment trust. My next guest is Mitch Rochelle, U.S. real estate advisory practice leader with Price Waterhouse Coopers. PwC is a global professional services network with 169,000 professionals worldwide. PwC is the leading professional services network in the world as measured by revenues. Mitch Rochelle, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Michael. And uh, Mitch, you guys just uh, published the uh, Emerging Trends uh, publication with ULI and PwC. Incredible uh, forecast and survey. Can you tell our listeners about that and some of the key takeaways? Absolutely, Michael. Um, so Emerging Trends in Real Estate is in its 33rd year, and it's really the longest standing um, piece of research in the industry. It's widely regarded as probably being the most predictive for a couple of reasons. One is it comes out first. Uh, there's a lot of uh, year-end forecasts that come out, and ours actually comes out first. But also, the, the topics included in the publication are based upon, this year, 950 interviews and online surveys completed by market participants across the country. So any sector from broker to investor to property manager to um, um, advisors, we we capture all of that information, lenders, um, we capture all of that information, their insights on the market. And uh, I think that that's very telling, and it's uh, very reflective of what uh, will happen next year. Uh, A couple of the big takeaways, um, clearly the recovery in the real estate uh, markets is slow. Uh, We called it this year the long grind. It's sort of uh, apropos of the New York City Marathon recently. It's a marathon and not a sprint, but it's clearly a recovery. And uh, it's going to take some time. Real estate's obviously a cyclical asset class, uh, and we're working our way up. Perhaps the trajectory of the recovery isn't as quick as some would like it to be, but it's a recovery nonetheless. Uh, one of the things that jumps off the page when you uh, go through the publication, and I um, welcome the listeners uh, doing so, we'll have a link uh, to the publication uh, on the website, um, is that the markets that are getting a lot of attention this year for 2012 are those markets that are sort of steeped in energy, um, high-tech, uh, biotech, uh, education. So in our top 10 markets, uh, the usual coastal gateway cities are included, but there's two new entrants in the top 10, um, Austin and um, San Jose. And I think what that tells me um, is the participants in the survey are looking to make investments uh, in the next couple of years in those cities that really have a proven track record for generating jobs and generating jobs in the industries that are going to be generating jobs in the future. Yeah, the job market is uh, really key, isn't it? Uh, So the real estate recovery is a long grind, as you say. So does that mean we have hit bottom? We're, We're definitely on the way up? I, I think um, that, and, and I believe there's some uh, there, there's some uh, graphics that you you can put up, but um, I, I think clearly it's 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 cyclical. But I think one of the interesting takeaways is why real estate as an asset class has gotten attention. So one of the things we did uh, was we took a look at uh, the real estate asset class and the, the yield on real estate um, compared to what some of you you know, investors' alternative uh, choices are. So clearly there's there's stocks, clearly there's bonds, and real estate is a significant asset class. If you look at the volatility of the real estate asset class going back a decade or so um, from a yield perspective, so we took um, the cap rates, uh, national cap rate index that uh, PwC also publishes on a quarterly basis, we compared that to the yield on the S&P 500 for the same period, you'll notice that the volatility of the coupon on real estate is not doesn't have as high of a beta as the volatility on, on stocks in the S&P 500. So I think what that says is that real estate's a cyclical asset class. Um, people are drawn to the asset class because of its stability. And I think, you know, we'll see, we'll see a recovery, um, but uh, it may not be, again, as quick as uh, other – 
some of the participants would like. I think one of the things we've seen in the recovery of late is uh, something that we refer to as cap rate compression. And what's happened is as money, foreign and domestic, has found its way back into the real estate asset class, we have a tremendous amount of equity chasing um, real estate um, and not a lot of debt. So what's happening is in those markets where, um, you know, your big coastal gateway uh, markets where um, investors feel that the job creation potential is the greatest, they're, they're, and without a lot of product on the market to buy, they're really chasing those properties and driving um, uh, driving uh, down the cap rates. And uh, there's, a, there's a nice chart that we have in Emerging Trends 2012, which um, we survey um, investors and we ask about um, the supply of equity and the supply of debt as well. And 56.3% uh, of the survey participants thought that equity for 2012 would be either moderately or substantially oversupplied. So, Michael, it's that oversupply of equity that's sort of creating this cap rate compression phenomenon. Okay. And this cap rate compression, uh, might that help the secondary and tertiary markets uh, get a little more investment dollars? Yeah, I think so. Um, and one of the interesting takeaways is um, we, um, in our survey, we, uh, we ask in market participants to rank markets uh, nationwide, and there's 51 of them that we um, – we ask them to rank. The ranking methodology we use is uh, a nine ranking is excellent and a one ranking is abysmal. <laughs> uh, all but one of the markets that we surveyed um, this uh, for this cycle for 2012 uh, saw an increase in the rating um, for that market. So, and obviously the big coastal cities are a piece of the 51 markets we we survey, but obviously not all of them. So um, I, I think that the investor sentiment is improving. Um, ET's all, emerging trends is a, is a lot of things, but I think it's an incredible barometer of investor sentiment. And the fact that the sentiment has improved for uh, middle America um, and some other markets that would be you know, secondary or, or even tertiary to some of the big, uh, highly populated cities, that tells me that uh, investors are bullish in general on the asset class and don't want to be part of the herd mentality of chasing Washington, D.C., and New York, and San Francisco, and Los Angeles, and there are plenty of great opportunities. Uh, um, and another interesting thing is if you look at the top um, markets in the country uh, in our top 20 ranking, nine of those markets, and many of which are sort of new to the survey uh, in terms of being in the top 20, nine of those are energy-oriented Technology oriented cities. So again, you know, we have in our in our top 20, Austin, San Francisco, Boston. Those are some of the usual names. San Jose at seven, uh, Denver at eleven, and Raleigh Durham at thirteen. Raleigh Durham's moved up considerably in the rankings. That tells me that what somebody would think of that as a secondary city, um, but uh, more importantly, it's the fact that it's an energy, uh, high technology, um, education hub, very much like Austin. It's perhaps the East Coast version of Austin, Texas. That's great. You know, we're going to put some of these uh, charts on the uh, website. So if you're listening to the show on uh, on the internet, you can check out these charts and hit these links now. If you're driving down the road, don't do it on your phone, right? Okay. We're going to have to take a short break. Uh, when we get back, uh, we're going to, Mitch is going to tell us where to put your money in 2012, the best bets, as the report calls them. I'm Michael Bull, and this is the Commercial Real Estate Show. We'll be right back. Commercial Real Estate Show podcast are brought to you commercial free by accounting firm Babish, Neiman, Kornman, and Johnson. Quality, responsiveness, and integrity best describe their accounting and advisory services. Visit bnkj.com. And by commercial brokerage firm Bull Realty. When your business requires proven performance, visit bullrealty.com. Welcome back. I'm Michael Bull, and this is America's Commercial Real Estate Show. Do you use Twitter yet? Well, it's fun, it's informative, and you can dive in the Twitter river or not whenever you like. And if you'd like more ongoing information from the show and our guest, our Twitter accounts are available at the show website. And speaking of Twitter, we have a show coming up in a few weeks on social media for business. If you'd like to receive an email or an update through your favorite social media about upcoming show topics, you can sign up at the show website, commercialrealestateshow.com. 
Well, today we're taking an inside look at the U.S. commercial real estate market and real estate investment trust. My guest is Mitch Rochelle with Price Waterhouse Coopers. Uh, Mitch, we promised some best bets for 2012 to our listeners. Where should investors be putting their money in, uh, in this coming year? Sure, Michael. I, I, the first thing I'd caveat is that I think caution still rules. Um, as I mentioned uh, before the break, um, it's a long recovery, it's a long grind, and 2012 may very well be a good year to start placing some bets in the in the in the sector. But uh, I don't think to use a poker term, uh, 2012 is a year to go all in uh, <laughs> because the recovery is going to be gradual, and uh, there'll be. Mm, Will be no doubt opportunities in 2013 uh, and maybe even 14 to still make some bets on the way out. Um, obviously, the you know the blue chip gateways have you know habitually been a best bet, um, but as we said before the break, I think the more of the secondary markets may be the opportunities. So rather than you know being a part of the herd, a best bet would be to look at secondary and tertiary markets. Um, the apartment asset class is still favored. Um, our survey participants felt very bullish about the apartment asset class, and uh, there's a there's a you know great reason for that. And one of the uh, charts that uh, may be up on um, your screen to look at, assuming you're not driving, um, <laughs> is, is sort of where we are in um, in home ownership versus rentals. So um, the home ownership rate is in at a you know historically significant recent historically significant low, um, and by the same token. Um, apartment vacancies are at a you know a reasonably um, noteworthy low. So the fact that vacancies are low, the fact that the home ownership rate is low, um, I think apartments are a great play. So um, looking for apartments uh, is a best bet. Um, looking for apartments in secondary markets and, and another opportunity that uh, the the survey participants felt very strongly about was sort of value added plays. Um, whether it's the apartment sector or whether it's the office sector, find a property that because of the lack of availability financing for the last few years or because um, the, the current donor doesn't have the, the means or cash flow um, to uh, really take care of the property from a TLC perspective. What we said in the survey was properties that need some love could be a great uh, opportunity. So buy a property that uh, has a little bit of deferred maintenance, hasn't been shown the love, uh, put those dollars in. I think the, the, the return on investment you'll see pretty quickly in terms of uh, the ability to raise rents and, and really create a better experience for the tenants, whether that's, a, you know, really any facet, uh, any subsector in real estate. Um, land, um, I, I think you can't overlook land. Uh, I think before the break we talked about uh, you know where we were relative to the bottom. Clearly we hit bottom um, in different markets, uh, geographic markets and different subsectors you know, over the last couple of years. Land is still at the bottom um, and, and probably not even bouncing around the bottom. So um, some of the cap rate compression type phenomena you see in income producing assets, you know, land being a non income producing asset by and large doesn't have the ability to, you know, compress cap rates. So I think picking up land right now may be a phenomenal opportunity. The the only challenge is how long do you sit with it and how long do you wait yeah. and if if Financing is scarce for income-producing assets. You can imagine how scarce it is. So it's an equity bet, but the returns on land historically have been phenomenal. And if you really sort of think about the world and civilizations uh, going back thousands of years, really the only way that the civilizations ever accumulated wealth uh, was through land acquisition. And when you look at value creation and real estate development, it's really adding value to land. So uh, land, you know, you can't overlook it as a as a as a good play. And lastly, we're at a historically low interest rate environment. So to the extent you can get financing, you can get long-term financing, and you can lock it in on a fixed rate for a long period of time. I think 2012 is going to be a period where you want to lock in financing. Um, our survey every year we ask our participants what they think about interest rates now versus in the future. Uh, they don't see interest rates going up next year. They do see interest rates going up over the next five years. So 2012 could be an outstanding opportunity if you can get it to lock in long-term financing at a you know, historically significantly low coupon. Right. Well, you know, conquering our neighbors and taking land. I tried that with my neighbor and knocked him in the head, tried to take some of his yard, and it didn't go over too well. So. Put up a fence. Good fences make good neighbors. And <laughs> just move the fence over and make my yard bigger. I'll try that. Yeah, I think uh, land is an incredible opportunity right now. I see some prices out there that 
just blow your mind how low they are. Well, you know, we're going to put the uh, report on our website so you can catch that and all these charts. Uh, Mitch Rochelle, thanks so much for sharing your insight with us today. We sure appreciate your time. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. And for more information from Price Waterhouse Coopers, links to the survey, Twitter account, website, and contact information, visit commercialrealestateshow.com. And by the way, if you're playing a drinking game based on show website mentions, you're going to need a designated driver. All right, we have to take a short break. And we'll have more intel headed your way. I'm Michael Bull, and you're listening to the Commercial Real Estate Show. We'll be right back. Commercial Real Estate Show podcast are brought to you commercial free by accounting firm Babish, Neiman, Kornman, and Johnson. Quality, responsiveness, and integrity best describe their accounting and advisory services. Visit bnkj.com. And by commercial brokerage firm Bull Realty. When your business requires proven performance, visit bullrealty.com. 